Uh, for the interpretation, uh, although it's not working right now, I do have to say a special thanks to ETC Therapeutics, uh, Little Brave Ones, and Tomatis for making this possible. It's, it's very challenging to have 11 languages translating, and we can see that there's already a little bit of errors with this, but for rare disease, we're an international group, and it's very important that we try to make this as accessible as possible. So although this seems to not be going the best for the translation, I do want to say thank you, and we're not going to give up on the translation. One of the most memorable translations that I've ever received was meeting another parent from Germany who talked about their child, and it really inspired me. And so I, I wanted to be able to do the same for our events. Also, I wanted to give special mention to Rare Disease Day. Uh, one of the quotes <laughs> is very popular for Rare Disease Day. O, o dniu, uh, chorób rzadkich, które dzisiaj obchodzimy. Uh, rare disease day is for the caregivers. We have seven out of 10 said that they coordinate their own care and four out of 100 had a dedicated care coordinator, which means that we're all doing this Jeśli on our own. Jeśli chodzi o opiekunów, siedem na dziesięć osób um, jest koordynatorem e, swojej własnej opieki e, i tylko cztery ze stu osób ma e, dedykowanego mm, and um, sorry, I had to mute someone, but for the for the quote that I just shared, this is our family. And I and I think it may be many of yours is that you are the person who coordinates all the care for your child. You are the person that has to spend the days inside the house trying to help your child. And this survey came out of the UK and it's very powerful to me and, and it kind of explains why we wanted to have today's presentation because many of us out there don't have anyone to help us. Uh, many of us out there are the sole provider for care or at least coordinate, coordinating the care, which means if your child is going to the doctor, seeing a physical therapist, uh, speech therapist, and maybe school, you have to coordinate all that together. Ideally, everyone's on the same page, but to make that happen, you would have to have a healthcare coordinator someone that knew uh, how to plan this, how to do this. And really that's that's us as a parents. So for Rare Disease Day, we use this hashtag at the bottom. And I really do encourage you to do your best to share, promote, and create awareness for Rare Disease Day. It's a simple action, but it does get our story out there. And if you go to rarediseaseday.org, you'll see a list of other events that you can join. And then the flow of our meeting today is that we'll have introduction, we'll have our PT workshop, and then we'll close with the Q&A session. Before we begin with our workshop, I just wanted to do a quick introduction of who you, who we are and, and why you should be listening to us. But uh, first up is Judy Wei, who is my wife. Uh, she's here with us as Teach Rare, but during the day, she's a special educator. Uh, myself uh, for Teach Rare, I'm a middle school principal by day, and then Ivana, who has helped make this event possible. Uh, Ivana is the founder of Little Brave Ones. She's also a board member for a working group called the uh, International Neurotransmitter Disorders Working Group. And so she does a lot. I, if you follow her, you'll see that she's always uh, busy. She's doing interviews, and she's just a great resource and a wealth of information for us. And then finally, our guest speaker today, Judith from Wings Therapy. And for all four of us that are here, we're all parents of rare disease children. We're all parents that are trying to find our way. And we're here today, not as experts, but we're here today to bring our community together to share the information that we all have, because really all of us, each of us are experts in our own way. And um, you'll find in our 
talk today that Judith has a very inspiring story, but so do each of our members and so do you. And we really want to empower everyone that's out there today to share your voice, to reach out to Teach Rare, to Little Brave Ones, to Wings Therapy, and help share your voice because we're happy to help uh, be that portal where you can share that information or help make make your own area a a place where you can help the people right there. We're all over the world and we really want to try to share everyone's voice. So I'm going to turn it over now to Judith and her team. Uh, while I'm doing that, I'll be working on translation. So please don't give up on us yet. Uh, I'll share this over to Jasmine, who will help uh, share the slides. It's all yours, Jasmine. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Rich, for the introduction. And thank you so much for organizing this amazing session. Um, before we actually go into the strategies for home physical therapy, um, just like to talk a little bit about our organization, WINGS, and the story behind it. Um, I have today with me my colleague and also my daughter who's handling the slides. Um, I am a special needs mom, just like um, all of you. I have a son, Jake. Um, he's 17 years old right now. And he was diagnosed with a very, very rare genetic mutation called NACC1. Um, there are just about 50 children around the world with uh, this very rare genetic mutation that is not um, um, inherited by any parents, but uh, uh, it's, it's completely unknown of. Um, they're still doing a lot of research around it. Uh, the symptoms of this uh, rare condition is uh, epilepsy. It presents like quadriplegic CP. Um, the children are also born with cataracts in both eyes, um, which, you know, over time they will go through surgery to, to get them removed. Um, but uh, WINGS is an organization that I started um, for my son, Jake. Um, Jasmine, you can flip to the next slide. Um, when he was... Uh, you know, we were not really satisfied with the traditional route of uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy. So we kind of traveled through the whole world, um, starting with Poland, California, um, Germany. We, we sought out all types of therapies to help him make his life better. And um, it's through this journey um, that we started this organization. And over the last 10 years, I've also educated myself, certified myself, so that we could bring these amazing therapies to the children in Asia. So WINGS is about uh, seven years old right now. And we, have, we are the only intensive center in Asia. And um, we have children coming to us from as far as Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and so forth. The foundation of our center is all about movement. It's something that I learned very early on with my journey with Jake, is that in order for our kids to get better, um, the recipe is really consistent movement. When we talk about frequency, intensity, and duration, frequency is how often do you do your therapy. And physical therapy is by far one of the most important components to your child. So how often do you do it? How long do you do it? That's duration. And the intensity is how challenging is the 
therapy that is provided to your child. So our center is actually based on consistent movement, which is, which is repeated for longer and longer periods of time and through varying levels of challenge uh, according to your child's ability. Jasmine? One of the things that we, I also found through my journey was uh, traditional therapy, especially for children with uh, rare diseases, rare genetic disorders. You know, you might find little uh, progress or, you know, it might take a very long time for your child to progress through. So we always encourage uh, parents to think out of the box, look for therapies which are non-traditional. Uh, they might not have double blind studies attached to it, but there are some very effective therapies out there to get your baby moving. And some of these therapies are the ones that I actually brought to our center are the ones that I found to be some of the most uh, effective therapies. And you can always look it up in our website, but we have our signature therapies are Cuevas Medic Exercise, which is from South America. We have Suit Therapy, which is Neurosuit and Therasuit, and a Spider Cage, Light Gate, Universal Exercise Unit, and so forth. But the whole, but the whole, but the whole basis, the whole basis of our programs is that. Um, you know, no child should be left behind. You know, there's always something that we can do for our children to move them forward. So since 2018, we've had over 6,000 kids walk through our doors and they range from a wide range of uh, conditions, Jasmine. So that's how we met Riley Ann. Um, she's one of our AADC children. And since then, we've had a few more come through. Um, when, when I initially started the center, I, I anticipated that we would see a lot of neuromuscular disorders. But the truth is that over the last seven years, we have seen approximately 80% of our patients have rare genetic diseases and we're, we're um, uncovering new, new genetic mutations almost, um, you know, every six months we hear something new. So, but what we find that no matter what your child's diagnosis is, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy is really foundational for them to move forward. So human movement is essential. In fact, it's critical to us. A lot of parents come to us and, you know, the first thing um, when we ask them, what is your goal for your child? And very often they will say, I want my child to walk. I want my child to sit. I want my child to hold their head up, you know, but there is a deeper um, reason for human movement. And there are some pillars that need to be built in order for your child to attain function, which, are, which is your activities of daily living. Now, one of the things which why human movement and therapy is really, really important is the first reason would be physiological. So without movement, your organs, which is your respiration, your digestion, your circulation, that starts to deteriorate over time if your child is not moving optimally on a daily basis. So if you want your child to be healthy, you need to get your child moving. The second reason would be your musculoskeletal system. And that is your your muscles and your bones. So what, what happens when a child does not move from a young age? We start to see 
um, deterioration in their muscle. Their muscle starts to waste and the bones tend to get brittle. The joints don't attach to themselves. So you might see over time uh, dislocated hips. You might see migration from the hips. So these are the two foundations of movement. So without the physiological and the muscular skeletal foundation, there can be no function. So it's really important that when you start your, your, your journey towards uh, therapy to understand that movement is not just for function, but it's also for your child to be healthy, to have a healthy musculoskeletal system, to have healthy circulation, breathing, digestion, metabolism, so bowel movements. So with movements comes bowel movements too. And we all know that that's something that a lot of us struggle with for our special kids. So movement is really, really important to get your whole system working. And then we come to the next two parts, which is function. Only with the first two can you attain head control, sitting, crawling. And movement also affects the mental and emotional state of your child. So as your child gets older, they will want to uh, socialize, you know, and movement is really key in, in any way or form that your child is able to handle it. So we're going to go into the next session, and this is my colleague, Cameron Han. Cameron is a director of uh, physiotherapy rehabilitation at Wings Therapy. He's also one of our founding members. He has over 15 years of experience. He started his journey um, in physical therapy in New Zealand, uh, where he was working with the pediatric community. And uh, when I first met Cameron, I asked him, why, why are you interested in uh, joining a, a center like ours? You know, so he said to me that I saw a baby that I had been working with and I was trying to get this baby to sit. And this baby went off and did an intensive therapy program. And four weeks later, he came back sitting. So that piqued Cameron's interest. You know, and since then, um, Cameron has been a critical part of our growth and our success and helping children from across Asia to, to progress. So I'm going to hand it over to Cameron. And anytime you have questions for either Cameron or myself, please uh, stop us during the presentation and uh, um, let us know. Over to you, Cam. Okay. Thanks, Julia. Thanks very much. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Cool. Um, yes, so um, first of all, I just want to say that, um, you know, it's been uh, very fun working at Wings. Um, I really enjoy working with the kids. Um, we have a lot of children with a rare genetic condition. And um, as a um, as a physiotherapist, um, even with 15 years of experience, I can say that um, every, I would say that um, every single month, um, there's always new um, genetic condition that I'm still learning about. So, um, you know, um, my knowledge is uh, I have to constantly upskill myself. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I think uh, that it's uh, really, uh, it's not uh, so simple, it's, it's not a very simple situation um, having a child with special needs, um, but definitely um, it's been a pleasure working with all the kids uh, that um, that came to Wings. Um, so uh, very happy to answer any of your questions um, and I will try my best uh, to uh, give everyone a bit of an insight about um, how you can move your child um, at home, how you can support them. So, um, yep, so off to the next slide. Okay, so um, I'd like to kind of um, start the um, 
the slides off um, to explain what is uh, what is a home program and what are the considerations for um, your child um, when you're doing exercises with them at home and how does it look like um, uh, from like a day-to-day -day, uh, point of view. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to give a disclaimer, okay, um, to make sure that you do double check this with your um, with your child's medical team for any precautions or contraindications um, on starting um, a home exercise program. And I think this is especially important with a child with rare condition um, due to the potential complication that may be associated with the condition. Um, so parents will need to consult your medical team if in doubt. Um, so for example, if your child is having seizures, um, if your child has um, a hip that is already sublux, um, if your child has never been, um, has never have any experience doing exercises at home, or you haven't have got any uh, experience doing exercises at home, definitely um, uh, look for someone uh, to uh, advise you and recommend your child the best uh, program. Okay, so so what is um, what is yeah what is a home program? Um, so really, um, a home program is uh, a, a range of exercises uh, that you uh, are uh, you are helping to support your child to perform at home. So the exercises can be a wide range of exercises. Uh, for example, you can be doing um, tummy time. You can be doing transition exercises. You could be using a stander with them at home, the walker. Uh, you could be doing... Um, uh, rolling, crawling. So uh, these are wide range of exercises that you can do with your child. Um, uh, on the other hand, you can also do specific uh, targeted exercises with your child. Um, so um, really a home program can look very different um, based on the condition of the child and really what the goal is for your child. So um, this is something that... Um, um, normally happens uh, alongside, you know, having recommendations for from um, your doc, uh, from the child's doctor or a physiotherapist. Um, so um, I would say that um, it's very important for your child in a home program uh, to help them expose themselves to movement. So um, really, um, when a child has a physical need, uh, what they are having trouble with is um, to explore the environment and often they do need uh, physical support from um, their caregivers uh, to, to assist them to be able to um, explore their environment, to understand um, you know, where their body parts are um, or re really even from a social level, you know, like um, having eye contact maybe with their siblings or with uh, yourself. So, um, as early on as possible, we really recommend uh, that you expose your child to movements. Um, the other point is uh, to allow your child to experience weight bearing. Um, and I think um, uh, Julia has uh, mentioned before that um, it's very important to, uh, to, to, to pre preserve uh, you know, your child's uh, bony structures and muscle flexibility. So uh, really weight bearing exercises has a lot of, a lot of um, benefits that I cannot emphasize enough. Um, okay, so the next point um, is parental support. Okay, so over here, um, really the idea here is um, for parents to learn about how can you best handle um, and support your child physically. Um, and often this will need to be done through um, maybe uh, uh, help from uh, uh, your child's physiotherapist phys or physical therapist um, because um, every child, um, they may need physical support in a very different way. Um, some child, they may need a lot of support. Um, some child, they may need less support. Um, so it's important to understand that um, in a home program, um, in order for the exercise to be effective, um, parents do need to uh, be open to learn how to um, maybe 
uh, handle their child with confidence. And I think this is a big part because we have some parents who are um, nervous about handling their child. They are worried that they might hurt their child. Um, so this is something that is, uh, it can be done safely um, as long as you have a physio who can um, assist you and um, teach you. Yeah. Okay, so the next point is, um, sorry, just need to, yeah. So your, the, the home program needs to be effective and challenging. Um, so this is to ensure that you are constantly uh, challenging um, the child um, in order for muscles to become stronger, in order for motor skills to develop. Um, not only does the exercises need to be consistent, uh, but the exercise needs to be challenging as well. So if you find that maybe um, you have been doing a set of exercises for your child uh, for months and you're noticing that, you know, hey, the exercises are getting easier. So maybe um, you first start, start them off in a standard and before at the beginning, they could only manage 15 minutes before they start getting upset or um, demonstrating, you know, signs of discomfort. Um, and gradually, it might be 30 minutes and then 40 minutes. So um, if your child can manage standing in the standard for 30 minutes to an hour, um, then maybe think about challenging them by um, letting them do something a little bit more active in standing. Um, once again, you will have to consult um, your child's physiotherapist and doctors to uh, ensure that this is safe. <laughs> Um, especially with those children with uh, sublux hips. Um, and uh, so I think I will just move on to the next slide. Okay, so what are the considerations that you need to have, um, you know, uh, for, for your child um, in order to perform like a home exercise program. Okay, so um, so we've mentioned uh, about, um, you know, children with rare genetic condition because all the condition looks very different. Um, so really uh, it depends on what kind of, um, you know, uh, complications or what type of um, symptoms does your child have uh, with this condition because that might affect um, their tolerance in the with the exercise. Um, maybe the intensity of the exercise needs to be very specific for your child. Um, so really, uh, it de really depends on um, your child's condition, what they can um, tolerate. Okay. Um, the other thing that's really important really is to consider like the age of the child because um, so... Uh, we recommend that uh, children, um, that as soon as they are between uh, one to two year old, that they, they should experience standing, they should start weight bearing. Um, and, 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 um, and so um, really uh, considering about what is the age of the child. So if you have a child maybe um, who is already five years old, uh, or maybe from three to five, and maybe they have not experienced what it's like to stand. Um, so that's something that maybe, uh, you know, you can have a chat with um, the medical team uh, and therapist to see, you know, is, is there any possibility for, for your child to, um, to, uh, to, to experience and to start having a standing program? Um, because this can be done safely through a, a standing frame as well. Um, and the other thing to consider is the body size of the child. So if you have a smaller child, um, you will be able, it's much easier to facilitate uh, and support them uh, with the exercise. Uh, but if you have a child who's a bit older and maybe, um, you know, uh, taller or maybe heavier, and um, you're finding that maybe their body size may be a challenge uh, to carry on uh, a home program, uh, that's something that you know you will have to you will have to modify the way uh, you support your child either through uh, an equipment or having an extra pair of hands um, and also uh, through maybe uh, speaking with um, the therapist that your child is working with to see how we can more effectively uh, you know support your child um, at home. Okay, so um, we we want to. Uh, also, yeah, so we also want to uh, consider about how regular 
uh, are your child's hips and spine monitored? So that's something that does uh, affect the, the, the home program. So if you have any child with scoliosis uh, or hip uh, dysplasia, sublux hips or hip dislocation, um, we will have to uh, be have we have to um, consider certain positions that um, might be more uh, unsafe uh, uh, for your child. So that's something that uh, we we will uh, you will have to consult uh, with your with your uh, phys physical therapist. So if your child has uh, sublux hips, for example, uh, then um, st uh, standing them may be. Uh, we have to uh, proceed with a bit more uh, precaution, uh, be more cautious when we weight bear them. Uh, so in the following slides, we will learn a little bit more about uh, how we can actually uh, uh, continue to allow your child to stand uh, and work through this situation uh, without uh, delaying their um, experience and, uh, and, and uh, chance to weight bear. Okay, so, sorry, let me just have a look. Yep. Uh, okay, so equipment's available. So um, the other thing to think, think about is uh, what, what equipments do you have at home? Do you have a gym ball? Do you have, um, for example, a massage table? Do you have proper shoes for your child to use? Do you have a stander or a walker? Uh, these things uh, are things to consider, uh, you know, when you perform an exercise because having some equipments may be useful uh, to help support your child and um, to make sure that you know um, you can perform the exercises safely as well. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, okay, so this um, this is an example. Uh, of a schedule of uh, of a child that I would kind of expect uh, a day looks like in terms of uh, getting them moving. Um, so um, it, 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 it is based on the intensive model of therapy. So um, it is it looks quite intensive. So um, so we split the days into three sec sections. So you have the morning, the afternoon, and then you have the evening. So uh, what you can see here is that really the child is active throughout the day. Um, I just want to, again, uh, just emphasize that um, for children who hasn't um, have a lot of uh, routine in uh, having a home program that looks like this, um, really, uh, I, I would like to emphasize that it's about building, uh, building the program up uh, at home for your child. So um, we, we don't expect you to um, take this as a template and start right away for your child. We would, uh, we would, prob uh, we would advise that you will start uh, slowly and gradually um, and also uh, considering your child's condition and all the previous considerations that we've mentioned in the previous slide uh, to, to apply what is probably more realistic and practical for your child. Um, and this can be done again through uh, having a chat with uh, your child's physiotherapist. Um, so this example here in the morning, um, normally when a child gets up, they're usually tight in their muscles, especially if they have high tone in their um, arms and legs it might be beneficial to um, spend some time to warm their muscles up by stretching it. Um, and then um, doing some active exercises like tummy time, um, transition, transitional exercises and uh, supported standing. So uh, this one here can be through uh, a standing frame. Uh, it, it could be done through uh, a support from your hands uh, on their trunk or their pelvis uh, with a immobilizer on their legs. Um, so there's many ways to go about um, um, uh, doing these exercises, but these are some of the examples that, uh, uh, this is an example of how a day uh, roughly looks like uh, 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 in terms of doing exercises at home for your child. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so... Um, so we just want to emphasize again that, you know, when we exercise, um, we really are looking at something long term. Uh, so we, you, we are aiming for something that is more uh, consistent, 
um, we uh, something that uh, long term wise, um, the child is going to have a good structure. So moving the child really helps uh, prevent them to have uh, surgery uh, uh, later down the track. Um, it can prevent so the earlier your child can experience weight bearing through the hips, the less chance of them getting a hip dislocation or dysplasia of the joints. Um, and a lot of the kids with rare genetic condition, they often have very low muscle tone. Um, and this is when it's really, really important uh, to allow your child to experience weight bearing. So weight bearing through the legs, weight bearing through the hands, um, and the other, uh, yep, and the need for medication as well. Um, so this is an example. So having Botox, um, being on muscle relaxants, um, or other um, uh, uh, or other needs for medication. Uh, for example, maybe when you do exercises with your child, uh, it allows them to be more fit and it helps their immunity, uh, you know, it helps their immune system become stronger. Um, so maybe when they are falling sick, you will, you will start noticing that um, that their reaction towards the, uh, the sickness is a, a little bit more mild um, and hence needing less need for medication. Uh, okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Can I just add a little bit about um, the exercises? Um, Cam was talking a lot about weight bearing and that is actually putting weight through your legs through your spine through your arms um that would be standing you know uh, it's very uh you know human beings are supposed to be in an upright uh, position and that is how all your joints are formed um and as special needs uh, parents uh, we get inundated with all sorts of therapies, you know, from brain gym to anatbanial to uh, acupuncture, acupressure, uh, stem cells, you know, uh, and the list goes on. But uh, my son is now 17 and he has never had any surgeries. Um, I can tell you very honestly that there is nothing that replaces the actual physical therapy, which is putting your child into different uh, movements and in standing postures, in crawling postures. These other therapies are add-ons. You know, they're always add-ons. So there is no uh, replacement for physical therapy. So it's, it's something that we have to to be really clear as uh, parents, because I've been through the same journey as uh, um, most of y'all have young children and you're just starting out and you're doing your research. And, you know, um, there are always a lot of case studies, a lot of success stories, a lot of testimonials. And um, I can tell you very, very frankly, had I not put my own son through a rigorous physical therapy program, um, he would have uh, a number of problems from displaced hips, scoliosis, contractures. And we see a lot of teenagers and children who are approaching their puberty years and they have sustained deformities. We've also seen kids that have done patterning from the Glenn Doman program on the table for years, and they have um, quite a number of deformities. So um, you can do all these exercises, you can do, you can do these therapies, but uh, always remember that the foundation of your child would be the physical therapy. That would be the functional weight-bearing, standing, sitting, crawling. Um, these are the most important things in your repertoire for your child. So everything that else that you research and find out and their miracle cures should be an add-on. It should never replace the physical therapy. Just, just something that we need to make really, really clear because uh, I've been down the same road. 
So, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Cam, carry on. <laughs> Thanks for that, um, the information. I, I thought that was quite helpful there. Um, okay, so what are the most effective exercises that we can do at home? So, okay. So we've mentioned about uh, full body weight bearing exercises. So you can see can, uh, in the pictures there, we have a child with a stander, um, and then we have Jake in the middle there with, uh, with Jude uh, standing uh, against the peanut ball. And we also have another girl there standing against uh, the wall. Um, in this case, is actually a massage table there. Um, so really the benefits is, uh, you know, we want to help your child increase bone density because if you, um, if you just consider a normal child who is developing, um, they do, as soon as uh, they are able to move, they are constantly trying to move against gravity. And there's a lot of uh, weight going through their joints. And that actually helps uh, the bone build up more minerals. It helps the density of the bone harden. Uh, uh, so um, it's, it's something that uh, humans are made to do. Okay. Um, the other thing, again, is, um, is to help with the stability of the joints. Um, it will help with the flexibility of the muscles and it really reduces the risk of fractures and um, having injuries. Okay, so we have um, the next slide. Um, okay, so how, okay, so so now you say, okay, Cam, um, so you tell me weight bearing is important. Um, I'm, I would like to try that with my child. So uh, so how should I do it? Um, so, so first of all, uh, we need to consider how much support now do you think your child needs? Okay, so if your child is having poor head control, so meaning to say that um, they aren't able to hold their head up for more than a few seconds, um, and um, they need a lot of support in their trunk, so we are talking about their the tone in their um, trunk being very low, um, so they, they might be having issues uh, sitting by themselves. Um, so this, this is when um, using a standing frame is very, uh, is, it can be very effective in allowing your child to, uh, to weight bear uh, as soon as possible. Okay, so, um, so the, the, um, the way to go about in getting a standing frame um, is to consult your physical therapist, um, because there are a lot of standing frames out there um, in the market, and it's important to, to, uh, to identify the most suitable stander for your child. Okay, so this is uh, an example of standing with maximum support. Okay, so now we're going to move on to uh, moderate support. Okay, so um, in this photo, you can see this girl, she's actually uh, developing a, a pretty good head control at this point. Uh, I would say that she's, she doesn't have, have full head control yet, uh, but she can lift her head up against gravity uh, for, for more than uh, about uh, 10 seconds. So here you can see she's wearing uh, an immobilizer in her arms. And um, what we've got one person in front and one person at the back. Um, so uh, we would consider this to be a moderate support. And that's something that uh, you can do at home with your child. Uh, if you have um, another pair of hands, um, if you don't have another pair of hands, then I would suggest that either you, you use a stander or um, you can have a chat with uh, the physical therapist to see how they can modify the exercise so that you, you can perform the exercises. Um, you can also use the immobilizers you see in her arms for her legs. That might help you to manage uh, the exercises if you haven't got another person to assist you. Okay. Um, you can also uh, get in contact with us as well if you're interested uh, to, to, to find out more. Okay, so the next picture there, you can see this girl who is standing against the support there. Um, so this is uh, what we would consider as standing with minimal support. So the child has good standing uh, head control, uh, pretty decent trunk control, but what they are really struggling here with is the balance and maybe uh, they might not have uh, you know, a, a lot of um, strength yet down their legs. Um, so uh, 
this is a challenging way to get them to learn how to balance um, and how to strengthen the uh, muscle in their legs while still allowing them to weight bear. Uh, so here are examples of uh, how you can stand your child at home. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so again, this is uh, an example. So it's the same, uh, it's the same, uh, uh, the mod standing with moderate support here, uh, but just a photo with different angles. So you can see that um, uh, with the immobilizers, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to handle the child's arms. Um, and uh, with, uh, with the legs, you want to make sure that um, they are being supported uh, firmly, but not forcefully. Uh, so we don't want to grip too hard and we don't want to uh, lock their knees so that they are in um, they are in too much of a hyper extension. So uh, just uh, have a have a have a look um, at, at your child's alignment. I think in here you can see that you know we're trying to get this girl to stand um, as, as straight in alignment as possible. Um, so if you're standing your child and maybe your child is leaning to the side, uh, that's when you really have to make sure that you either consult um, um, the, uh, the, um, the child's uh, physiotherapist uh, and, or you might want to go back to using a stander. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is, um, this is standing without equipment. So this is us at Wings. Uh, and this boy actually, he he he's developing some head control there. He does not hold his head up, and he does not sit by himself yet. Uh, but you can see with uh, with uh, support through his uh, elbows and um, his knees against my uh, my body, uh, that we can actually support him uh, to weight bear. Um, and, and what we're trying to achieve here is we're really trying to get him to learn how to hold his head. We're trying to get him to weight bear through his arms. So we're trying to actually target some, um, you know, shoulder strength here as well. Um, and, and also weight bearing through the legs. So this is, this is a, a really effective exercise uh, to, to get the child to, to do some active standing. Okay, so move on to the next one. So this is... Um, yep, a video of standing without equipment against the wall. Yeah, so so uh, so this girl here, she has got an atypical Rett's uh, syndrome, and um, as you can see, she is trying to balance, learn how to balance here. She's got good control in her, um, you know, in her head, her trunk, and she's actually activating her her leg muscles, uh, quite well here but what she's lacking really is uh, having balance so um, if your child um, is at this stage you can consider standing your child against the wall um, just make sure you do pat the wall up so that they don't um, hit or bump their head against the wall okay so we'll just move on to the next slide okay so crawling and four point what is it so important Okay, so um, crawling and four point has a lot of benefits and I can't emphasize that enough. We do this a lot at Wings. Um, it's not the child's favorite um, exercise, unfortunately. Uh, they do struggle with this exercise a lot. And I, I will, uh, I would say that a majority of the parents, they will report that their child actually don't, the, they, they, they might cry doing this exercise. Uh, they, they will be, uh, a little bit upset um, when you're doing this exercise, but over time when you're doing this, they will get used to it and they will, uh, you will see benefits from doing this exercise. Okay, so uh, so in this exercise, you can actually achieve uh, weight bearing through the arms and that's really a good way to strengthen up their, uh, their arms. Um, and uh, strengthening up the arms has a lot of, uh, it's, got, it's associated to being able to develop more fine motor skills. Um, so you do need a lot of shoulder stability in order to develop your dexterity. Um, and weight bearing um, through the knees um, is good for the hips. Um, yeah. And uh, 
bilateral movement activates left and right hemisphere of the brain. So this is really a patterning movement that we are talking about here. So when you're moving all four limbs, uh, uh, what you're doing is you're really stimulating the brain and that's going to help stimulate um, neurons and uh, pathways to to speak to each other. And that's something that you need um, in order for your child to learn about uh, movement. Um, that's that's quite a basic uh, basic step. Okay, uh, so the next one here is uh, hip control and neck strength, yeah. So in this position, we can also uh, allow your child to develop uh, more hip control and neck strength. Um, and also uh, it helps them to develop spinal and visual development development so um in because of the way the eyes are aligned in in uh, uh are actually scanning uh, in this position they actually do learn a little bit more hand eye coordination so this is this is really an early stage of you know what a hand eye coordination looks like and this will over time help them with picking up um other types of gross motor skills um, so this is one of the foundational exercises that we uh, we would often include in a child's home program. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so how can we uh, perform this in with uh, with maximum support? Okay, so as you can see in the picture here, uh, we've got this uh, uh, this child uh, uh, in four point position. So uh, his body is actually supported. Uh, by his uh his uh caregiver's hands or thighs and then his hand is that is is on the floor with uh either a pair of immobilizers uh if your child can already bear weight then um he does not probably need an immobilizer uh but in this case for maximum support often um if your child's not holding his or her own head and if they've got very weak arms then i would suggest having an immobilizer on that that can actually uh help lengthen the amount of time they can spend in this position um and you can't quite see there but the knees are actually um it's bent um 90 degrees uh and the hips are bent 90 degrees in, in um so just imagine the four point position okay so in the middle here you can see uh with moderate support so there is no more support under the trunk so that's the difference between the maximum and the moderate support. So um, here we see the child um, supported uh, at the arms and also at the pelvis. So that's something that, um, that you can try. Um, and then also with minimum support. So if you your, your, child's, um, the, your child has got uh, decent head control and uh, decent trunk control, you can consider uh, just going to the pelvis and uh, just providing them that extra bit of balance so that they can stay in this position for a longer length of time. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. I just want to show um, all of you what an immobilizer looks like. This is an immobilizer. And uh, it's something that you can use for your child's arm, which you strap on. Um, if your child has poor strength or weak shoulders and elbows, it's something that you can use for the arms. Similarly, for standing postures, you also have a um, longer immobilizer for your child and you can put your child in a standing posture. So it's just, uh, it comes in very small sizes and you can use it even for a child as young as seven months. So there are very tiny ones too. Um, so this is what it looks like. So you open it. There is a rod here that keeps your child uh, arms or legs straight. Can, can you all see it? So this is something that parents can use at home as a tool to help you to crawl for the arms and also for standing. So, yeah. So just uh, let us know if you have any questions regarding the immobilizers. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Julia. So that, that is an example of an immobilizer. Okay, so, um, so now crawl, uh, lying down to crawling. Okay, so we have this 
this precious girl here on the floor. And this is uh, Julia here trying to help her to get into that four point position. So you can see she actually went to her pelvis and she kind of brought her pelvis backwards and automatically the girl's hand came back uh, by herself. So this is a really nice uh, response from the, from the child because uh, she's actually uh, assisting us during the exercise. So, so the child is actually participating uh, at the same time. Uh, so in the four point position, what you need to do is you, you need to support um, and hold them, um, their hips and their knees in that 90 degree position, because if not, they will, they can fall forwards and they can hit their um, face against the, the mat. So you want to make sure that um, you do use a, a proper mat when you are doing this exercise, um, as well as um, being quite firm um, with assisting them um, at the pelvis. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is actually Riley Ann. <laughs> this this was uh, <laughs> in 2020 when Riley first came to us. Um, so this is uh, crawling with no immobilizers, but we've got um, uh, the two of us, one at the back, one at the front. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, do a reciprocal patterning. So you've got the right knee moving and then the left hand going um, and then followed by the left knee and the right arm. So you're always going uh, in a diagonal fashion. Um, so what you're trying to do here is you're really trying to stimulate the right and the left hemisphere in the um, um, in the in 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 the head, um, and you can see at the beginning when we started with Riley, she doesn't really <laughs> quite enjoy. Uh, oh, the, she was uh, uh, screaming. <laughs> you can't uh, expect your child to scream when they start when you start a crawling program, but it is by far one of the best exercises that yeah. we can recommend. And uh, I'm sure Richard and Judy can can tell mm -hmm. you that um, all the effort that they've spent at home trying to crawl her um, has all paid off. So, yep. So this is uh, an example um, of how you can crawl without an immobilizer with uh, two people. OK, so we'll move on to the next slide. OK, so transition. So um, so transition actually means getting the child from one position to another position. So this could be getting from lying to sitting. It could be getting from sitting to standing. It can be getting from uh, sitting uh, uh, to lying uh, or from sitting to four points. So these are all transitions. Um, so transition is really helpful in allowing the child understand between their body parts body position and space because they are really never they are, they are they are trying to understand oh um in order for me to get from this uh, point to another point um i need to know where my arms are so i can use my arms to help me to get myself to to the next position um i need to know where my head is so that i so that i can um, protect myself and not fall off uh, um, and, and hurt myself. Um, so that's a really good way for them to understand about um, their body parts. Um, again, it helps them understand, um, uh, develop, sorry, it helps them develop uh, healthy joints, uh, spine and neck, um, and it helps with head control and visual development. So we're just going to move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is a video of uh, how you can position your hands. Um, you can hold the child at the mid trunk um, and you can roll them to the side. You need to make sure you roll them all the way, 90 degrees to the side and then 45 degrees uh, angle upwards. So what you're trying to do here is you're trying to show them, you know, hey, this is the way we can get ourselves from lying to sitting. And this is one smooth movement. Um, you need to make sure that if your child is uh, resisting the movement, uh, not to be too forceful with them. Uh, and uh, if you are struggling with this exercise, uh, always check uh, with uh, the, the therapist, uh, you, know, uh, you know, whether there is any other way you could handle the child to allow this to happen. Um, yeah, 
So we can see she's this girl is really good at holding her own head and um, she was assisting as well. She was assisting us with uh, the sitting up. So this is a really nice response that we, we would like, uh, we aim for, your, you should aim for your child to have. But okay, so um, we'll, just, just yeah. to caveat that um, this child came to us about two months ago. Um, she could not sit. She didn't have a, um, a trunk control. That means she couldn't hold her torso up. Uh, she actually found this exercise quite difficult. Um, but she attended therapy for an hour every day for the past two months and this is the result from it she could she couldn't do this in the beginning of the session but you know we actually uh started this program and then we also taught the parents how to do some of these exercises and we then prescribed a certain number to the child to the parent to be undertaken every single day. So in this little child's, and she's 14 months old, uh, in this little child's uh, case, we prescribed that the parents do five of these in the morning, five afternoon and in the evening. So that is an example of what uh, frequency, intensity and duration is all about. Um, it's to keep repeating the exercise and then move on to a more challenging variation over time. Yep. Thanks, Julia. So, uh, yep. So just to emphasize really the uh, frequency. So the repetition is uh, key here in order for the, uh, the neuro neuroplasticity. So the, the pathways to connect in their brains, they do need the repetition. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is uh, an older child here. She uh, She's actually demonstrating how uh, to get from sitting to four point. So here you can see she's got good head control and trunk control. Um, and, and all I had to do was uh, I went to her arms and I just kind of uh, guide her to get into that position. So um, if your child is quite... Um, is quite uh, capable of uh, holding their own head and they've got good trunk control, you can just uh, go ahead, go, go, go to their shoulders and try under their shoulders and try to um, uh, lean them forwards and see, can they get into the four, four point position uh, with less assistance? Okay, so we'll just move on to the next slide. Sit to stand with hand support. Okay, so this is a really good one to do. Um, to get them into standing. Mm -hmm. So you can sit the child in the starting position, you can sit them on um, a small little stool um, and then place, uh, using the immobilizers, you can place their hand uh, either on the couch or in this case, we've got a, a bench here. And what you're doing is you, you're you placing your hands on um, here. You can see the assistant's got her hands on the, thigh, on the thighs. Um, I think uh, that it's, it's um it, it may be easier um if you start off from a little bit higher which is the pelvis uh you can try facilitating the standing movement uh, uh, there first if you notice that it's easy you can go down to the thighs but um just to let you know um you can shift your hands uh, up and down based on um you know your child's ability so again what we're trying to achieve here is um we want to make sure the child is actually leaning forwards and not backwards against your body you want to make sure that the child is actually in alignment and they are not skewed with they are not leaning to the side um and you want to make sure that their feet is in the right position when you're standing them um so that they are not um they they are they are having good footwear and they are not rolling um in or out Okay, so we'll just move on to the next slide. Um, okay, so sitting to stand without weight bearing on hands. So this is um, this is to stand the child without uh, use the use of the hand. So you can see that we've got our hands on her thighs. Um, and what you're gonna see shortly is you're gonna see us translating uh, her, her, her thighs, you know, a little bit forwards and upwards. And what you can see is she actually 
uh, assisted us in this stance. She actually brought her body forwards and she engaged her trunk, she engaged her head, and she engaged her knees as well. So this is um, this is if your um, the child has uh, decent head control and trunk control. All right, so we're going to move on to the next slide. Sit to stand without weight bearing on hand. So this is another way. So um, the, the difference is uh, you are behind the child rather than being in front of the child. And again, the same way is you've got your hands on their thighs and you're translating their thighs forwards and up. So they are... Uh, the what they feel is you, that you are leaning them, uh, that you're bringing them forwards, and their their trunk is going forwards, and they're standing up. So this is really nicely done. The girl is actually uh, activating uh, her you know her hip muscles, her trunk muscles, her thigh muscles, and her knee muscles here, and um, and all we are doing is you know guiding them into that move into that that position. Okay, so we'll just move on to the next slide. Okay, so so we're just gonna uh, conclude uh, with uh, Riley Ann's case study here. So when Riley came to us, um, she was uh, she was only sitting, uh, and she was she was rolling to the side, but she couldn't roll all the way onto her tummy yet at that at that point of time, um, and. Uh, what was complicated was that uh, she she did have a uh, hip dislocation on the left side, um, and uh, and and so uh, we had to have discussion about how we can uh, work through this situation, um, and uh, yeah, Riley had also limited control in her trunk, um, and also um, in in regards to her hand, her fine model, uh, con uh, her fine model skills, she if I'm not wrong. At that point of time, she was learning to touch uh, objects and, you know, she, she loves touching like toys and pianos and things like that, but not quite grasping um, and holding objects in her hands. So we're just going to go to the next slide. Um, so this is, a, this is an example of Riley Ann's home program. So this was back in 2020. <laughs> and um, as you can see, we do give parents uh, quite a good amount of exercise to do. Um, and I did categorize them uh, under different goals. So we want her to have better trunk control and we want her to be able to transition. Um, we want to allow as soon as possible for her to weight bear. Um, and we want to help her um, develop more um, function in her upper body and her upper limbs. So this is an example of what we uh, we we gave uh, to Richard and Judy to do at home. Um, but um, what I didn't put it in there. At, oh yeah, I, sorry, I did put it in there. Is uh, the repetitions. So so as you can see, it's 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 about the frequency. It's about um, the consistency, and really, it's about. Uh, um, the in, having that intense model of therapy here, but of course, if um, I I would say that you know maybe Richard and Judy can say that you know it's not every day that they have to do all of the exercises, but they have to pick um at least three to four exercises to um to to perform on a on a on a on a regular basis. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. So this is Riley um from. Uh, March 2020 to August 2020. So as you can see, we were working with her transitions uh, and, you know, we're doing quite uh, foundational exercise. Then um, this is five months later, we were, um, we were actually teaching her, uh, you know, how to wait bear, how to stand. This is a very active way of standing. Um, Riley did um, get a standard um, in between as well. So she was already having a regular standing program uh, while we were getting her to actively stand um, during therapy. So that's something that we kind of gradually build up on. So um, just like what I've uh, mentioned before, we don't start off um, just, you know, um, all at, it all at once. We we build it up slowly. We build up her, her stamina, uh, her tolerance to the exercise itself. Um, and gradually, she, she's actually able to accept the exercises. Uh, and, and she was able to, you know, be happy during the therapy as well. Okay, so we'll just move on to the next slide. I think that's 
that's yeah so um so we've come to the end of our presentation and i would like to open up the uh to uh, the uh, q a uh to to everyone so if you have any question please um richard do you think they should uh type it in the, just, the box uh, or? can i just round up um so just just to be really clear on what are some of the most important exercises that we have outlined today and that is standing um, um, the children that you have seen in the presentation are kids that are not standing and some of them are not sitting so standing would be one the second would be crawling and the third would be transitions that is moving from a lying position to a sitting position and moving from a sitting position to a standing position. Now, the three, um, the three components that we have outlined today are really key to your child's development in terms of physiological function, in terms of the musculoskeletal system, and in terms of function. So these three components, um, if you do nothing at all, and you just work on these three items, you will see some progress if you do it consistently. So um, we are now open to any questions that you might have. I have um, some questions that were written in the chat, but uh, before I turn that over, I just wanted to say thank you very much. And uh, just as a parent, not as someone leading the presentation, but as, as a parent listening to you, I just wanted to, mentioned the things that stood out to me and that was um you had talked about the four pillars the mental and emotional state mm -hmm. so as we're doing physical therapy we're also building the mental and emotional state for a child and we neglected that a little bit as a parent and we didn't have as much progress but when we revisited that we found a lot more progress and i i don't want people to to minimize what you said there because that was that was very important also, the crawling aspect or the four point doctors told us that most likely she wouldn't crawl. It doesn't happen. When we went to wings and we talked to the therapist, they said, OK, maybe that's so. But there are additional components into trying to teach your child to crawl. And Cam talked about that with the um, neuroplasticity, building neurons inside of the brain, crossing the midline or building coordination. So even though. Uh, maybe your child doesn't crawl, there are additional benefits that come to doing these exercises at home. Uh, and that adds on to the standing and weight bearing. So your child may not be standing, but you're going to reduce the surgeries, like Julia said, for her son. Just by putting in them in this upright position that the child should be in, you're going to benefit your child uh, skeletal system and muscular system. And then I just wanted to add in, um, when we do these exercises, you could see my daughter in them. She was crying. Uh, we layered these exercises we did at home with education. And education doesn't mean that you have to be a teacher to do this. You can easily sing a song, teach them their ABCs, show up pictures of their family and teach them what is mother, what is grandma, and you're going to help make the exercise a little bit more enjoyable, help motivate them, push them a little bit further uh, beyond so that when you're doing your homework at home, you're doing these exercises and you go back to do physical therapy, your child has made a little bit more progress and is ready for those therapies. So I really wanted to thank you for your presentation. And one of the first questions that came in was, could you just quickly explain the difference between intensive therapy versus regular therapy? Uh, intensive. Um, I can add. I can answer that question, and then Cam, please feel free to add to my question. Intensive therapy is when you do the therapy um, more than an hour a day. Um, it could be twice or three times a day over a long period of time. And intensive therapy, most of the traditional physiotherapists will expect to see you once a week 
or twice a week, sometimes three times a week. But the intensive model of therapy and research has shown that the intensive model of therapy, anything between two to four hours a day over a span of three to four weeks, um, you know, demonstrates, they demonstrate that the brain changes. Now, I actually want to caveat one thing is that sometimes some of our kids may have quite severe uh, genetic mutations or, um, and we may not always be the ones that get our child to walk. And I can tell you, my son is one of them. Um, he's not walking. He's learning to sit at this point. But, you know, what I have realized over the years, and especially since starting Wings, is that um, in terms of physicality and his health, he is in perfect condition and he continues to crawl. He continues to do the transitions. We still work at it. Um, but because his condition is such, he hasn't attained that function. So it's not always and hundred percent that we might, that we will attain walking if we work through uh, intensives. And we've been through 110 intensives and his first intensive was six hours a day. But um, I can see improvements every single day. He hasn't been through a single surgery and most of the teenagers that are, you know, from 12 years old and up that are coming to see us are already candidates for a lot of surgery and the surgery does not improve function. So if avoiding surgery is one, should be one of your key goals as well. So I just want to caveat that because a lot of us do a lot of us parents have kids with very rare diseases, and sometimes we may never get to see that function, but keep working at it. I'm sure we'll see something, you know, the most important thing is that our children are healthy and uh, they avoid all surgeries. Thank you, Julie. There's uh, four, four more questions that came in. Uh, one was about walking. And I uh, need to find the question, but it, it seemed that they were asking about the gait and they can walk now. Let me find the question. I'm sorry. 20 steps, right? That's correct. Yeah. So they can do walking and so improving the walking and maybe the, um, the duration. So the question is, uh, I would like to ask about <laughs> exercises for kids that are walking, but are hypoto hypotonic um, and the walk is on a white bait maybe a white base and they get tired after 20 steps. Yeah, so, so, so the thing about uh, children with uh, hypotonia, so low tone is that, um, you know, generally kids with low tone, they do have to use a lot more energy. They have to use a lot more, they have to work a lot harder in order to uh, engage their muscles and, um, and, and they will get, uh, you know, they, they will uh, get tired uh, easily. So, um, so you would like to find out, is this question about what exercises your child can do? Um, so just wanting to clarify, is it, is it the alignment that you're worried about or is, it's, um, is it building up their stamina? So if it is, um, so if it is um, an alignment issue, and uh, and for children with uh, low tone, what generally happens to their ankle is that it does roll inwards. So that's what we call a pronated feet. Um, and quite often, we would recommend that you get uh, um, supportive shoes. So um, an orthotic shoe. So. Uh, so two two uh, two brands that we actually use uh, at Wings here is the Mimo shoes, uh, and we also used uh, the Billy shoes. So if your child's wearing an AFO, um, which is the splints, the ankle splints, um, that can actually help um, allow better alignment when you're walking the child. Um, so if your child gets tired after twenty steps, I think the key here is to. Um, you know, to, to continue, you know, um, 
after 20 steps, I would just give them a break. And then, um, you know, after a few minutes of break, I will uh, let the child try again. So you're, you're, you're gradually building it up again. So if, if they can do 20, 20 steps, you want to see whether they can do, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, more consistently until you can get them to a little bit more. Um, I think the other thing is, uh, is that we might need a bit more information uh, in order to assist uh, and answer the question a little bit to, to give you a, a more um, uh, specific answer. Uh, but for, yeah, for, for our child, uh, we, we might um, uh, get um, another pair of hands to, uh, to support them by the, um, by the arms so that they, they get that extra support through the trunk. So it really depends on is, is your child um, able to hold their, their trunk by themselves um, so, yeah, so maybe you could clarify a little bit of, uh, about the details and we can uh, help answer the question a bit more effectively. I have another question here and it's a, maybe a two part question. So uh, first is, does physical therapy help with epilepsy, dystonia or, or ocular gyric crisis? And I'll just start with the ocular gyric crisis. For us, it didn't help and we had to plan our physical therapy at home or with wings around those therapy sessions. So we had to time it at a time where we knew it wasn't gonna be likely for her to have an OGC. For epilepsy, maybe Julia could kind of answer, what is yeah. what do you do um, if a child has epilepsy? Okay, so what we have found um, in our experience is that uh, when you embark on any new program for a child with epilepsy, you might, you might see an increase in seizures until the brain adapts to that activity. So it really varies from child to child, but it isn't a good enough reason to stop the physical therapy. So for children, um, who, who are affected by, by uh, um, epilepsy, then what you would do is you would take it a little slower and then monitor the child's situation. So if you see that the seizures are increasing, you might dial down the intensity because the child is absorbing a lot of information when you are doing a new program, um, so, and it, and it can be anything, you know, it can be physical therapy, occupational therapy, it could be speech. So sometimes when a child absorbs a lot of information, it might trigger a seizure. So that's something that you have to be very observant. And when you see that happening, you need to dial it back. When you dial it back um, and proceed, um, at a lower intensity. And when you see that the child is not, not reacting with seizures, then you can take it up a small notch. So it activity doesn't help with seizures, but over time, um, your child will get used to the physical activity. So we do have a lot of children with uh, different, actually 99% of our kids that attend wings have seizures. So we tend to monitor their situation. And in some cases we will recommend to the parent, let's not do an intensive, let's do an alternate day program. So the days in between you do a smaller program at home, you know, so they might come Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, they might do a home program, which is of a lower intensity. So monitor your child always. And another thing is that we want to say that if your child is feeling unwell, you should stop all physical activity. Any type of therapy that you're doing, let them rest, recover, and then you can proceed on again. You can carry on with your therapy. Thank you, Julia. That was perfect. And I didn't see any more questions come in, but I'm I'm going to share my screen quickly and if anyone has questions in the meantime please do share but i just wanted to show that we have our next events coming up 
which is the third Sunday of every month. So next month on March 19th, we'll have more specifics about occupational therapy. April 16th, we will do speech therapy. And for us, this was very important because we couldn't find a speech therapist. They didn't want to treat our daughter until she was much older and we knew she would have speech issues. So we found someone that was able to guide us in how we can achieve our speech therapy with the therapist and at home. Sensory integration, we started this and we left it and then we came back to it. And when we did sensory integration, we found that we could make more gains inside of physical therapy and occupational therapy because our daughter was less anxious. Then we have behavior therapy on June 18th, which will be SAN uh, therapy and um, ABA therapy, which you, you find a lot for autism. If anyone is familiar with behavior therapy of autism, it can be adapted for our children in the rare disease. And then after that, we haven't determined a location. We would like to bring it to Singapore, where Julia is right now, and where we once called home. But we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but you do know that we will be offering a in-person event and we may offer it one in Europe and one in Asia. So that really excited to do that. We also have two giveaways to just save time. We will do it by email, but one person that would register today will get this book that was written by Dr. Aditi. Um, she wrote this book. She's a, a doctor and she's uh, an advocate of the rare disease community. And it's the first alphabet book that's dedicated to rare diseases. It goes through each of the letters and it also teaches about awareness of a rare disease that matches to that letter. We'll also be sending out a Billy footwear, which uh, Cam talked about, how these shoes can be, uh, they're adaptive. So they have a zipper on them or they allow you to put in AFOs or other types of gaiters. So they're, they're amazing shoes that look stylish, but they're also made for our children. And they're by a, uh, a guy named Billy Price who had a um, spinal injury and he became paralyzed and he didn't let that slow him down and he created these footwear. So we'll be sending out a $50 gift card to purchase these and shipping is included no matter where you're at in the world. I think we have one uh, question. Which, Go for it. Uh, yeah. I think it's my three-year-old son is crying on doing a stretching exercise with his PT. Should the exercise be stopped so he stopped crying or should we go on? Um, that's a really amazing question. And um, I think the first thing that we would like to ask the parent is what kind of cry is it? Is it a cry because the child is in pain or in distress? In, if that is the situation, you should definitely stop the exercise. However, um, what we have seen with a lot of kids in the four months old to about five years old is that they tend to cry during the therapy session, especially in the first couple of weeks. And uh, that cry is more of uh, uh, they're angry, they don't want to do the exercise. But you know, we always tend to ask the parents, uh, is your child okay? Is this cry okay? But physical therapy should never be painful. It should never, never, never inflict any type of pain or discomfort to the child. It should be challenging. It will take the child some time to get used to it um, because they, they, they can't really, it's really hard to negotiate with a three-year-old, uh, do the physiotherapy because we want you to walk, you know? So that level of negotiating is not there. But what we find is that, um, when the frequency is increased, so for example, um, if you send your child to school once a week, um, when they first start going to school, 
They're going to cry every single week because they need time to get used to that environment, they, to get used to the routine. It's very much the same with physical therapy. So what helps a young child to get adapted to the program is to take them every day, if not every day, three to four times a week so that they get used to the environment, they get used to their teachers, they get used to the exercises and they understand that, hey, these are my friends and they're trying to help me. Um, if you're seeing your physical therapist once a week, then it's not enough time for the child and the therapist to actually develop a bond. Um, it needs to happen over a longer period of time. So always first assess your child's crying and, and understand if it is, uh, um, you know, if it is a cry for help because it's pain, distressful, or it's a cry for help because they don't want to do the exercise. So that is the first thing that you need to know. Um, yeah, but it's okay if the child is crying because they don't want to do the exercise, it's okay to carry on because it doesn't damage them uh, emotionally or, um, you know, there is no damage to the child. And over time, you will see that they will stop. And I think uh, maybe, Rich, you can add to this because you have experienced as, as I have with your own child. Yeah, and it was thanks to uh, my our therapist, Wings, definitely, because we were so scared at first and all Riley did was cry and I felt like she was the loudest one in the clinic. And we just put our faith into our therapist. And then, uh, as Julia said, you slowly build it up. And even at home, we slowly built it up. And it, it was a learning curve for us, too, as parents. And we stopped when we didn't feel comfortable. We didn't want to do any harm. So we stopped as parents. And as a team with my daughter, as we became more comfortable, we could increase that duration. And you may feel discouraged because you're, oh, we only did we would, we would only do five steps and we would feel discouraged. And what I would say to that is that, um, and we'll be talking about this more in our other events is, okay, pause on the physical therapy, but there's still progress to be made in the areas of occupational therapy, uh, working on fine motor skills or um, speech mm -hmm. therapy, sensory integration. So you don't have to feel discouraged. If physical therapy starts off a little bit slow, okay, that's all right. And then you can slowly build up the duration or meet with your therapist to find the correct exercises, but continue to work on those other areas. And as I said, the, um, the sensory integration and the behavior therapy actually did a lot for us to make more progress in the physical therapy area. So don't discount those. Um, yeah. Types and, of activities. and I think that we all have to remember that, um, and I went through the same journey and, uh, uh, my child crying was more traumatic for me than it was for my child. So, um, you know, I, I trusted my therapist and I decided to, to leave the room from time to time because uh, uh, watching my child cry made me feel sad, but my child got over it. Uh, I was having a hard time dealing with the crying. So, you know, it's often more traumatic for us as parents to see our child crying. And, you know, being in a therapy um, session is not, it's, it, it's, it's not part of normal development. You know, it's something that we have to go through um, with our child. And it's never easy to see our kids cry. And I'll take this last question and then we'll close. But uh, Ivana asked, how can we exercise with children with dystonia? So if they're tensing of the muscles or their, their muscles are not flexible or their, their body isn't, um, it's kind of the opposite of being hypotonic. Um, yeah, so with, yeah, so with, with uh, dystonia, basically we are talking about um, a lot of involuntary muscle movements. Um, so, um, first of all, I'll, I'll definitely still go back to the point of weight bearing. I think that it's, it's important that they, um, that they experience the weight bearing through the arms and through, through the, through their feet and through their knees and through their hips. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's, uh, important. Um, it's, 
tricky to handle children with um, dystonia. So it really depends on how severe uh, the dystonia is uh, in your child. And, um, and at Wings, we have uh, quite a few children with quite severe severe dystonia, and we um, we do learn to use uh, you know quite a um, uh, we do support give them a lot more support um, at the beginning, um, and we uh, and I think Julia can um, add add to yeah, uh, add I, to I it think, as um... well. You know, one of the hallmarks of NACC1, which is Jake, um, is dystonia. So there are a lot of tools out there that can help you with dystonia. I mean, we just raised one of it, which was the immobilizers. You can use immobilizers for some of the exercises. Um, there are other things like weighted vests. You know, there are pressure garments like... Uh, uh, DMO orthosis, orthosis, there's the theratox, you know, when you're giving your child a little bit more pressure and weight, you might be able to slow the uh, movements down a little bit. But then there, there might be times when your child's dystonia is in an all time high. That's the time where you know, you need to actually um, understand, is this a good time to do therapy or should I wait for the movements to calm down a little bit? But there are uh, sort of tools that you can use during your therapy and garments, um, pressure garments, weighted garments um, that can help slow the movement down so you can still do the therapy. So suit therapy is something that we use for children with uh, uh, a lot of involuntary movement. Jasmine shared some of those links and the names. Uh, so mm -hmm. definitely take those down. What I'll do is I'll, when we put the video together along with the slides that Jasmine also shared, we'll put this all together in an email. That way everyone has access to it. And I do appreciate everyone attending and special thanks to to Wings for staying a little bit longer and, and giving us all this helpful information. It, it does make a difference. And everyone that joined today, you being here makes a difference. We're helping to raise awareness. We're helping to motivate other parents. And really, I look forward to our next event. And I hope that everyone uh, attends. And, and thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Good night. It was nice to meet you all. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>